welcome uh, to my talk. I hope you enjoy the conference so far. Uh, and I hope you learned something uh, from the other talks because I don't expect you to learn something useful uh, from this talk. So the title of the talk is Implementing a MIDI Player in Kotlin. My name is Piotr Jagielski. Uh, I'm a senior like Java Kotlin developer from uh, Warsaw. I work at Talk, it's a software house. And we were uh, using like Kotlin on the backend since like mid-2016. I have like a huge, uh, huge uh, amount of code written on the backend. Uh, you may know our company. We have some uh, from this library called Crash. It is a lightweight uh, layer on top on Exposed. If you don't know Exposed, I definitely rec recommend checking it out. And also we have uh, a product. It's a kind of uh, UI for defining streaming APIs but it's unfortunately not written in Kotlin. Um, and one more last thing about me, I recently got interested into this live coding music thing, but I not, don't have any like uh, particular musical um, education, so I'm just developing tools, and you may not expect that I will compose something uh, sounding really good. And last thing about Kotlin in Poland, we have like tough times because it's also a brand of uh, ketchup. Uh, so we get to these jokes about like Kotlin is being on sale and so on. So it's tough times. And yeah, so going back to the title, you may ask why a MIDI on a Kotlin conference. And I also ask myself, so I got a couple of reasons. So I thought that Kotlin is uh, MIDI is more like uh, Java, I will explain it in a minute, and um, actually JDK has a pretty good uh, API for MIDI, and we will explore it in a MIDI. Also, thanks to coroutines, it is really trivial to implement a MIDI player uh, in Kotlin, and I will also show it to, uh, in a moment. And uh, I will uh, also talk about something called open sound control, uh, which is a kind of different approach. And I like to think like the open sound control is to MIDI like Kotlin is to Java. And last, uh, as a bonus, I uh, state that this is quite easy to implement a live coding uh, music environment uh, in Kotlin, thanks to Kotlin uh, scripting. Uh, yes, so basically starting from the beginning, uh, what is MIDI? How many of you, which was a quick check, are familiar? Okay, so, but nowadays you just ask uh, ChatGPT for this, so I just did it for you, and uh, I asked for a description, and then to put a slide, but unfortunately this free, free version is not uh, able to create a slide, but th those bullet points are pretty um, accurate. So basically, it stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It's a communication protocol uh, used for transmitting uh, digital information. So it's not about sending like audio signals, but rather some metadata about the, the sound. And these are put into the MIDI events uh, that can be uh, like played in real time or stored in some in uh, MIDI files for like later playback. And yeah, the original specification also contained those like funny cables to connect the devices, but now you can just use uh, USB and uh, for communication. So basically the idea is that you can have like multiple devices and some of them have built-in keyboards and some uh, don't. So you can have like one keyboard, uh, which is called like a MIDI controller, but like in Java, it is the transmitter, and the device that is receiving the events is a receiver. So here there are two uh, synthesizers that are just a receiver, don't have this, this keyboard, but you can like play, uh, playing by playing on the keyboard, keyboard trigger the sounds uh, on those external devices. Mm. So yeah, going to this, why, why MIDI is like Java? You, as a Kotlin developers may think that Java is really old. Well, MIDI is much older. So yeah, I just keep talking with the chat GPT. So yeah, the MIDI was introduced in uh, 1983. And it was like collaboration of uh, major uh, um, hardware manufacturers that time. So Roland, Yamaha, Cork just cooperated in uh, creating this, this protocol. 
Yeah, and I, because I like to well, get know what happened in a given year, so I just uh, kept uh, talking with ChatGPT about various events. So it was time that Michael Jackson released Thriller uh, album and also the music video, uh, which I guess was voted for one of the best music videos all, of all time. And those music videos was, were played on something called MTV, music television, when that time played actually music videos, not those stupid like reality shows. Uh, and also it was like a time that Metallica released their first album and some state that this is like the last good album of Metallica. Uh, and also, yeah, regarding movies, it was the um, release date of Return of the Jedi, the last part of the first uh, Star Wars trilogy. And from our, uh, from our land, it was uh, a year that Apple released this Lisa uh, personal computer, which is uh, described as the first uh, personal computer with this graphical interface, mouse and keyboard. So, yeah, so this may say how old is, is this thing. So the, another question is, is it like still alive? Is it still a thing? And I also uh, think that this, this also is a question uh, asked uh, for Java. I came across this uh, meme some time ago, so yeah, it, it never ends, it's, it's looped. But yeah, there, <laughs> Java had this, this like, the, I guess, tough times. After Java 8, Java 9, the release cycle was not that, uh, it, the releases took very long. But now it's like get back on track. It's I think it's the most uh, the, the most uh, in a um, better place it was uh, any time. So yeah, you may think uh, you may also ask: Is is MIDI is MIDI still alive? Well, uh, actually it is. And uh, the funny thing is that this there was like MIDI 1.0. And there was no MIDI 1.1. There was this general MIDI with, which described the MIDI files. And uh, recently, the MIDI 2.0 was released after 37 years uh, of the first specification. And it, uh, it remained backwards compatibility with MIDI 1.0. So yeah, it's, I, I don't know what, what happens with this, but this, uh, yeah, so, so we might think that like MIDI is like a solid foundation for all the music industry. So whenever you just buy uh, some gear, you it always have this, this MIDI port. Uh, and also you can transmit MIDI uh, through the USB. And yeah, so this is maybe something similar to Java. So this is like a stack trace for the uh, newly generated Kator application. So this line here is everything below this stack trace is just a pure Java like Netty. So there are like um, HTTP servers written in Java like Tomcat, Jetty. And yeah, I think this is good about Kotlin that is just not reinventing the wheel, not rewriting everything, but just uses the solid foundations uh, from Java. And yeah, also Java has a pretty good documentation and uh, API. Um, uh, the, the funny thing is that if you just have this, uh, every Java application, it, it's capable of playing MIDI files. So yeah, these are like uh, the five lines you can just um, write and uh, you can pick any MIDI file from the web. And uh, by executing those lines, you can uh, you can just uh, play this MIDI file, and I will show you how it sounds. Um, so I have this one example here. So yeah, you may that uh, it sounds really silly, like some uh, chip tune, but I found some better example. Uh, it's like this uh, Steel Dre by Dr. Dre, uh, a hip hop sound, which is... <laughs> So 
So yeah, it got uh, all the drums, all the stuff. So yeah, like in every technology, you can think that if you just uh, take it to its limits, you can like achieve uh, uh, some good results. Mm -hmm. So basically, the the idea of this first uh, part of the talk is to just take those five lines, or five lines of code, and like explore the MIDI API in, in Java using Kotlin, and maybe write a, a custom player for this. So uh, I will show you some snippets from the Java docs because they describe, uh, I think, well, uh, what is like modeled. So if we have this, uh, if we load the MIDI file, we have this sequence, and uh, each sequence contains multiple tracks. So you may think that uh, a track is like if you have different instrument, each instrument should have uh, its, its own track, and each track contains multiple uh, MIDI events. Uh, so, using like Kotlin, we can just uh, by having the, this this MIDI file, we can like iterate through the tracks with some uh, index to to get to know what which track we are uh, in, and then iterate through the all events uh, in a track. And here we can find out that each event contains a tick, so it's uh, somehow. Uh, uh, information about when should this event happen, and then it has the the message itself. And with the print line, it uh, it doesn't look that good. We didn't, we knew the, we see the ticks, but the the classes have no two string implementation. So, but what you can see here is that we have uh, two basic types of those messages: the the meta messages and something called fast short uh, messages. And Going back to the Java docs, we actually can find out that there are three types uh, of MIDI messages. Mm, but the, the third type is the system exclusive messages, which are not interesting for us. And uh, the meta messages, we can find out that they occur in MIDI files and not in the protocol. So this contains uh, info about the song, the lyrics, the, the settings. So this might not be. Uh, interesting for us too, so we can just uh, take the, the short messages. So if we look at the short message, it uh, generally contains the three properties, the command, uh, the data1 and data2 fields. So it, uh, if we just um, make another iteration about that code, we can limit uh, all the messages just to just the short messages. And then re retrieve all those three properties: command, data one, data two, and print line uh, instead of whole message, just just those. So yeah, we have some progress. We have some like uh, numbers, not that uh, class name, but yeah, we don't, we still don't know what are what the numbers actually mean. So this is the time we have to like dig into uh, MIDI specification. And we sh we can find out that uh, yeah this um, data one data two fields uh, are varying uh, if we have different like uh, commands so for every command this this field can mean something different and for example this uh, note on and no note off messages so if you just press a key on a keyboard it triggers the note on messages. And all the keys are numbered using uh, the integers from 0 to 127. And uh, this is the note on the message sent when you press the key. And when you release the key, it is the note of uh, messages is being sent. And it must match the, the same uh, key number that the note of sent uh, previously. Also, there are th those control change events. So if you have... I don't know if I use this. No. If you have th this like knobs, uh, some controls on the keyboard, you can like if you just um, turn those knobs, it will send the control change message, and it will be the control uh, number uh, sent and the control value uh, along among with this this message. Uh, so basically, summing uh, uh, and yeah, if you are curious, where there are. Uh, to 127 because it's a one byte message so but the first bit is used to distinguish between uh, the data bytes and status bytes so so this have this ones and this have zeros on the uh, start with zeros uh, 
Uh, yeah, and when we go back to the Java API, we can find out that there are some constants for all the all the MIDI commands. So to to like sum it up, uh, if you know this this notation about this about uh, representing uh, like melodies, so in this uh, in this axis we have time. And uh, I would say that this time is rather continuous. So there are those ticks. So basically, it's not uh, in mathematical sense it's not continuous. But yeah, that those events can happen in any tick. So there are no structure in in the time in the time. And on the other axis, we have the MIDI nodes, which is more like discrete. So every node has a number, just an integer representing this number. And if the note is being played. So we have the note on event on a start uh, with this. So note on is 144, and some uh, some, num uh, some number uh, representing this note. So this this case is 57. And when the note ends, uh, it is note uh, off. So 128, and also the uh, 57 um, as uh, uh, for the note on. So if we go back to our data, we can see that uh, this um, can represent uh, a note being played. So at tick zero, we have the, this uh, note on command with, 50, uh, with the note, uh, note number 57. And on tick 240, we have note off with uh, the same number. And uh, it, it, if you look at the different events from the files, it should represent different different nodes. So what we can do now is um, like to limit again our code uh, is, um, apart from uh, uh, filtering just to short messages we can just use the note on and note off commands to like do something with, with this with this events. Uh, so the plan for me is to like uh, implement a custom player for this events but uh, I thought I don't like this idea of like matching the note on and note off uh, messages, so I I'm just more like a data structure guy. So I would like to have a, a separate data structure to represent the melody. The, if we have the data structure, we can transform the events from the MIDI files into this newly uh, designed data structure, and then. Uh, use this data structure to implement the actual player. So my proposition for the different approach is to cr first create some structure into the timing. So instead of having those sticks, uh, I like to represent in, in bits. So it's more uh, a dis something more discrete. So, but of course, you can have like one bit, uh, half a bit, quarter bit, but you cannot have like any, any number, uh, now starting at any number bits, any decimal number. And for the MIDI nodes, I will keep the, this discrete model with just the numbers. And this gives, gives uh, us another uh, good thing that we can also represent the node duration using this bit. So instead of having this MIDI on, MIDI off, uh, note on, note off messages, we can just store a duration of the nodes. So the the data structure that can represent the notes uh, is something like this. So we have the beat that is when the note at, at, at which beat the notes occurs, the MIDI note, which is the, the number from the MIDI, the duration, it's also in beats. And yeah, I have this volume, which is like, because I don't like, I convert it to between zero and one. So what uh, we should now do to, um, to like map the MIDI events into this new structure is to like uh, uh, convert those ticks into into bits. So uh, every MIDI sequence has this property called resolution, and uh, there are like multiple division types. But fortunately, uh, those uh, files that I found are using the uh, PPQ, which is uh, the, which means that the resolution means how many ticks are in actual bits. So uh, this is pretty good for us. So just to convert, which we should take, take the event stick and just divide it by the, this resolution uh, given uh, for the sequence and just make some, some rounding to make it uh, two decimal places. So the final, the final code um, 
it's uh, like the first version, the lazy version. So we just take the, the command, the MIDI note, the, uh, the, uh, the volume, uh, the beat, uh, as I showed you before, how to convert, and then just um, because we are lazy, just uh, set for every note the duration of quarter beat. So we have we can just uh, limit to the note on events and don't match uh, with the note off. But if you are curious, I also have this version with uh, matching, but it's yeah, it's, it's uh, requires some from multiple state. But yeah, it, it it works also. You can trust. You, you should trust me. Uh, yes. Yeah, so <coughs> having this model, our our uh, like note uh, uh, representation can look like this. So we have like just note happening in some bits with this MIDI notes, durations, and so on. So uh, now to implement a player, we need uh, two more things. One is the scheduler. Uh, so a scheduler is a function that just takes a time, um, some future time, and a function, a lambda function, and just um, like uh, executes this function at the, as this given type. And I'm uh, just uh, using coroutines here. So. The beauty of coroutines is that you can just like delay the given time you want, and you don't have to more, more worry that much about uh, resource consuming. So we just delay and then invoke the function. And the second thing is something I call the metronome, uh, and it may not be perfect match to the metronome you know. So the metronome is something that takes the BPM uh, as an argument because. The beats are also something like abstracts, so we have to uh, have a way to convert the beats to actual milliseconds. So to do this, we use this beats per minute. It is a common in um, like electronic music, so it it represents how many beats we have per minute. So the common value is 120. So we have like two beats per second, but we want to have something uh, opposite, so how many millis we have per every bit. So for two, uh, 120, we have like uh, 500 milliseconds. And having those two, uh, we can now implement a player. So a player is something that takes the list of nodes in the, um, the new structure I showed before, and this metronome, and it has a function to, uh, that plays all the notes at a given time. So it just iter uh, iterates through all the nodes and computes the apply time for a given node. So it takes the node bit and uh, calculates how many, um, how many second this, this millisecond this bit means. So it just um, multiplies this. And it adds to the, the time that it has uh, as a start time. And at this plate at uh, time, it just schedules the, the second function, which is actually playing uh, the note. And yeah, the play note function um, is like here we have, because yeah, we want, uh, still want to play MIDI, so we have to convert uh, our events, uh, our data back to the MIDI events. So the, the MIDI player is something that takes a receiver. This is an interface from the J, uh, Java API. And receiver can have this function send. So generally, we, uh, if we want to play a note, we take immediately we uh, send the note on messages with uh, note on message with this note. And we compute uh, when the note off should happen, but this is easy because we have the node duration and we multiply it by the mm, metronome millis per bit property. <coughs> and we are, should be done. I don't know what is, okay. So I have another demo for you. And this is the MIDI sequencer uh, written in Kotlin. Uh, Okay, maybe I will just... Mm. So basically, it uh, uh, default is not something particularly different from what we heard uh, before. But uh, we can now do two things. One is to control the tempo, because now we have this BPM as a parameter. So we can like uh, play the same song using different 
different tempo, so this is uh, a bit slower. I'm sorry. And we have also the um, ability to, uh, to change the instrument uh, that this um, track uh, is being played. Yeah, because I didn't uh, tell you one thing, that I'm just uh, selecting one track from, uh, from the whole MIDI file and also the loop it, so it's just uh, looped in, in infinite, in infinitely. But yeah, this is still sounding because it's this general MIDI specification, which is not that um, complex in uh, defining the instruments. So um, actually what we can do is um, connect to external synthesizer because uh, now we have the receiver as a parameter for our um, MIDI player. And what we can do is like uh, found out, find out which uh, MIDI devices we have um, in our system and just uh, find the, the uh, needed MIDI device and uh, use the receiver from the device, not from, the, uh, from default. And I got something uh, because I got this um, open source uh, synthesizer, which is called Sarge XT, and okay, so it uh, plays something, but I'm not good at it. And yeah, if you just uh, yeah, I have uh, this another he thing here because in uh, Linux uh, we have to provide something like virtual MIDI. There is a kernel module for this, but you can. Uh, uh, skip this for this. Uh, what should you know? It uh, is this. Uh, here we specified that this synthesizer is just um, waiting for messages for this VIR MIDI um, uh, MIDI input uh, created by the system. So if I just switch to this, we can hear that actually the. Uh, synthesizer. So the copy code uh, is now read the file and it's triggering the MIDI events and the synthesizer is playing the events sent by the Kotlin code. And we can like play around with uh, different uh, knobs here. Uh, we have, can have different presets. Maybe for this uh, venue we can have something like this. And we have different synthesizers so we can we can have filters, so do some like EDM music uh, here. Yeah, and this is it. So going back to the slides. Um, but yeah, well, we are still missing a few things. So basically we don't have like the super accurate timing because like we are using uh, JVM and we can have garbage collector unless you are doing some like high frequency trading you will have uh, this issue. Also um, we can play only one uh, synth at uh, a given time unless you just set up some, uh, some crazy thing with the MIDI channels. Also, we don't uh, know how to play like drums and uh, the loops uh, uh, together with our synths. Also, we don't uh, have a way to apply uh, global effects like filtering, reverb, and so on. And yeah, controlling the synth pattern. So I can do it uh, manually, but it's not that uh, super easy. Uh, yeah, so what can we do uh, with this? Is this, uh, there is uh, something else apart from MIDI, so it's uh, open sound control. Um, generally, it is not compatible with MIDI, so it's a different approach. Uh, there is a table showing the differences, and the, instead of uh, the MIDI messages, the open sound control contains those messages like uh, URL style, so you have the URL uh, and then you have, can have any parameters, they can be like ints, doubles, everything and what is really nice about this it uh, that it has some concepts uh, concept of bundles and the bundles is like some transaction uh, in this uh, specification so you can like send multiple uh, if, uh, messages uh, with a single bundle and uh, the server should like execute uh, all of them uh, at once and also this this bundle has something like time tagging so you can like uh, match 
uh, mark the time tag for the bundle and the server is capable of like if the time tag is in the future it should like store this this bundle and then um, execute it uh, when this time occurs so this gives us advantages advantage um, because in Kotlin we can just like upfront compute the times and then like send it uh, um, ahead of time, I would say, and uh, the OSC server will store it and um, execute when when the time uh, arrives. And uh, second nice thing that is that we have uh, Java API for OSC and uh, using our structure, it is really. Mm, easy to like implement instead of MIDI player the open sound control player. Uh, so here we just having the OSC server as a parameter, and all we can uh, we should do is uh, like take instead of uh, manually we just take the play time and uh, use it as a time tag for the OSC bundle we are sending. So I have another demo uh, with this OSC uh, player. So the, the software is called Super Collider. Uh, this is the OSC server and it, uh, it has this all features. I talk about, about the, stagging, the time tagging, but it also can, uh, you can um, represent some uh, uh, synths by using some fancy uh, language. So basically, if I play this shoot, but it's really so basically, this is the same as before, but um, uh, apart from the synth, I'm using some like bass. But uh, also, what we can do here is use some add some drums. Uh, but I guess I have to restart this. Uh, so you can add some so this is using just uh, drums uh, so the single uh, samples with like uh, bass drum and uh, snare but also you can uh, you can use all uh, whole loops so I have some Predefined and uh, downloaded from the internet, uh, but legally uh, loops, and you can have. Yeah. So basically, it uh, it is still the same. So here I'm just using the same uh, uh, API to like uh, because I have this file and I'm reading the the melody from the file and just transferring it to the OSC uh, representation. And what what we can also do here is that um, we can like specify the uh, parameters of the synths uh, used by Open Cell Control. And they can be like time um, dependent. So we can. I have this LFO uh, function that just takes the minimum and maximum value and the number of bits, and it just computes uh, uh, before sending uh, the uh, actual value of this parameter. And also, you can like I have here. It's like you can apply some global parameters uh, to all the. So I'm playing a filter on the, all the drums, so it just uh, rises and then goes uh, back. Yeah, so this, is, this may be uh, fun, but uh, we are still missing some one point. So uh, you, you see that I had to like uh, change something and then uh, execute the program. Uh, from scratch, so we are missing something called uh, live reloading. And basically, we can use uh, Kotlin scripting for this. 
so I don't know if you, because I've seen this talk uh, at the previous Kotlin Conf uh, about the Gradle uh, scripting, and it is really a great introduction into the Kotlin scripting. And also, uh, yeah, yesterday was a talk about this um, de demo scene, and it also used this open renderer uh, framework, which has a similar concept. And basically, the, uh, this is implemented also in my library uh, for live coding. And the concept is uh, really simple. We, we are um, just using the JDK watch, uh, file watcher a service that just uh, can send you a message when the uh, file gets um, saved. So you can have it open in IntelliJ, and if you make some changes, save it, it, you will, uh, it will trigger an, an event. And yeah, what I'm doing here is for every change, I'm just uh, reloading the Kotlin script. So I have a script which looks like this, and uh, every time I just save it, it should be like um, reloaded through the library. Uh, so this, what is in the script, I, you can represent like the patterns. So the, I don't know if we were at previous talk, uh, uh, yesterday's talk, there was a lot about like mutable uh, state. This is uh, something a bit better because we just have to um, return the model, so the data structure. So I have this something that creates an infinite structure and then just limit it to some given uh, loop time and then it just loops over and over again. I have some uh, other uh, concepts like defining the chords, for example. So I have an uh, API to like define the chords and then like to repeat, you can like mix it with the Kotlin API. And yeah, also this is, uh, I mentioned before the way to um, specify the, uh, the parameters that change over time. So we have like some uh, synth parameters and also uh, some effects. So this is like the DJ filter. Uh, yeah, and going to the final demo, I can show you something that I created.
Amen. Uh, and yeah, if you want to ch check some more, so this is uh, some links. Uh, I actually have this uh, blog post uh, that was meant to be a series, but it's have just one uh, element. Uh, but it's just a um, step-by-step uh, uh, what I did with this, this MIDI event. And also, if you are interested in other tools uh, within this live coding music space, I have this awesome uh, live coding music list. You can check this, this out uh, there. And yeah, thanks again. And uh, see you at the, at the closing keynote, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>